check one two. And number two. Check, mic, check, mic, check, mic. Two. One, 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 you're receiving signal. One, two, one, two. But I saw before that you're receiving sound. One, one, check, check, no. Check now. Check. One, two, one, two.
Test, test, test. One, 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 test, test.
Perfect. Hello, hello. Theon, can we st is it? Can we start? Is everything working like uh, this time? Technics? The okay. So welcome everybody here at uh, Johann Königs Gallery, and uh, also I have to highlight the location. The location in Saint Agnes. It's uh, this beautiful place here um, where we are the very first time inaugurating our well-being culture forum in the so-called physical reality. We started it in the so-called virtual reality. This happened uh, in the wake of COVID, um, when COVID uh, started all over the world and we had to close down uh, the economies. Um, we decided that we need to start thinking with people uh, that are close to us, that, uh, that we admire, that we believe uh, can help us uh, to figure it out, uh, to talk about the future of cities and the future of uh, the organization of our lives in cities. And uh, I personally learned a lot in this time. I learned that everything is dependent actually on culture. So while we had these lockdowns and there was this binary solutions of uh, social distancing or vaccine discussed all over the world, basically Professor Axel Kramer, the founder of the German Association of Hygienics and Hospitals, when I called him uh, to ask him how we can make our thermal baths more safe um, uh, and hygienic so we can exclude uh, the uh, uh, contingency um, and the transmission of viruses, he said, this is the wrong question. You need more viruses and you need more bacteria and not less. Um, and the problem is that our culture basically created a world uh, that is um, very much disconnected from nature, what is also our own nature. And uh, we, we learned through this crisis, uh, um, in my opinion, an incredible amount of, uh, of knowledge. Um, and uh, we started this Wellbeing Culture Forums always on Wednesdays uh, in a very tight tact um, with, with, with a lot of um, input from all over the world. And um, um, Markus Fers, that is here on the, uh, on the stage, uh, was with us from the beginning with the Design Magazine as a partner. And we are very thankful for this, Markus, that you are now here the first time when we meet in the physical reality. Um, and um, we are now um, basically um, merging the two realities. So we have here the, the reality that is physical. We have on the screens our guests that are, um, that are joining this conversation via Zoom. And then we have our audience uh, divided between the people here at Johann Königs Place and St. Agnes and the people uh, at home um, on the screens. And um, I'm very happy now to welcome the guests uh, to this talk. This talk will um, highlight this topic of creation in crisis. So as uh, we all know, uh, yesterday we compared it in the session Breaking Bauhaus um, today with the situation 19 19, when Bauhaus was created, it was also a situation of extreme pressure on our social systems, on our populations. There was the Spanish flu, uh, 1917, the First World War, obviously, and then the industrialization that led so many people um, to move into the cities, and the cities had to be recreated, and then this incredible process of creation started, maybe something that we are missing a little bit today, where artists, uh, architects, cultural workers came together and recreated, reimagined and recreated our cities and the way how we live in the cities. And this kind of innovation and pressure that is, uh, that is coming through crisis is exactly the topic of our, of our discussion today. And I'm very happy to uh, introduce the panelists. Um, very short, so it won't take uh, any more time, uh, this introduction. So uh, here um, to my left is G.V. Lee. She is an artist now based again in Berlin. As I learned, she was under lockdown in Casablanca. She couldn't leave Casablanca that she wanted to visit for four days, for four months. She will tell us a little bit about this. She was locked down under 
under circumstances that you definitely can count as crisis and um, and I'm very happy to learn how this uh, influenced you, your thinking and um, and I'm extremely happy that you are here because I consider you are like an amazing artist with installations that were really mind blowing. Um, the same I can say about Julia Strauss. I'm extremely happy that you came here, Julia, um, from the Martin Gropusbau, where you are co-curating the exhibition Down to Earth, where we were able, honored to see your performance yesterday, to hear you singing, to see the snake of the indigenous people representing uh, people on the forefront of uh, our culture, the culture that still uh, is connected to nature, the indigenous cultures that you are also representing, always representing on this stage. Thank you very much for being here. Markus Fers, I already introduced you. Thank you for being the partner of this talks uh, from the beginning and looking very forward to, to our conversation. Then Julieta Aranda, she is uh, for me a big example. This is uh, a little bee flying around my head. Yesterday on Julieta's place, Thomas Saraceno was sitting and actually uh, he told us the story about uh, the bees and, uh, and the, um, uh, the spiders, that we are always afraid of them. And when they come to us, we try to get, uh, get them um, to fly away. But actually, when you don't do anything, they don't do anything as well. So, um, yeah. Uh, now you are sitting on the place of Thomas Saraceno, and I think that, uh, that you are here is amazing. You are not only an artist that is... Uh, uh, worldwide known, but you also founded EFLUX, and this is how you connect uh, artistic uh, practice, information, and um, uh, activism in, in a way that, uh, that that is probably exactly the interdisciplinary way of thinking that we need to have, and that uh, that a crisis shows how uh, how important it is to be able to to react in this way. So I'm I'm really curious to to hear your take on our topic today. Then Johan, thank you very much for being here and thank you for um, being co-host of this event series. Um, uh, as I already said yesterday, you do an incredible job because you are actually an artist uh, gallerist, in my opinion. So you have the approach of an artist towards curating uh, and taking care what curare means, uh, like, uh, right? So you are taking care for, for your artist, you are staying with them for for the lifetime, um, and this is how you are able to reach far out of the usual white cube into the city. Now uh, you uh, proposed uh, together with Anne Brandelhuber the Moise Bunker as a new center, international center for for creativity. And uh, I think two days ago they announced that they won't demolish the building, so there's a chance that this building will be taken over by artists, and this is also this outreach from from creativity that happens in a white cube into creativity that can really go out in the city and and yeah and I'm very happy to have you here and Sarah Wilson um, today my co-moderator that I will now give the microphone to um, to start with the first questions uh, she is our very first advisory board member since we founded together the Therma Art Program at the Royal Institution in London in 2017. And without your, you know, advice and uh, patronage, um, I'm sure that we wouldn't be here right now. So I'm absolutely grateful towards you, and I'm very happy that that I can give you now the microphone to uh, to start this panel. Thank you very much for, uh, for to our audience for being here, and a big applause for the panelists. It's on. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Mikolai. I didn't know that you were going to immediately pass me the microphone, and I'm very, very honored to be with such an illustrious panel because um, I've discovered the breadth and not quite the depth of a lot of what you've been, all of you have been doing recently, and it's a, it's a really extraordinary combination. So I was going to talk, but I'm not going to give my little prepared talk at this very moment at all. I was going to talk about the necessity for intellectual and spiritual resistance in times of crisis, uh, which is an immaterial thing, but this doesn't map immediately onto the problem of the city. I hope it might come up a little bit later on. Uh, and I was going to as, as well say that um, 
how intellectual and spiritual resilience, which is part of well-being, can't be, as it were, manufactured. It can be, it can be enhanced by beautiful situations and beautiful architecture and so forth. But I've studied all sorts of uh, situations of people in extreme pressure. And people in extreme pressure, and I, so I was so impressed by some of the works you've done. I mean, it, Julia's work um, with refugees, and with we were talking about uh, her work with uh, Chelsea Manning, her, that piece. People under extreme pressure need intellectual and spiritual resistance. I had a very cushy lockdown. Like many privileged intellectuals, I was doing my own thing and walking in parks. I know that in some countries people weren't able to work, walk in parks. I felt really, really guilty uh, experiencing virtually through information the very, very dreadful situation many people were in. And in fact, I live in a part of the East End Mile End, which suddenly I discovered on a little plaque that's normally about bees and butterflies in Mile End Park. It's where people buried all the plague victims um, of uh, one of London's other great moments of plague and crisis. But really, your first question was, where did you actually spend the time? You know, how have you main, remained grounded in your work in the midst of such precarious times? I think there's a lot of different levels of precarity. And maybe later on, I'll get back to the things that have really concerned me. Taking us back, actually, Mikolai, to our vernissage of 24-7 at Somerset House, actually, before the crisis. But I think I'd just like to pass them. So we have you more present uh, in our round, as we're the only one now um, on the screen. Thank you very much for being here. I see. Thank you so much for having me. And my apologies. I didn't. I had assumed that this was all online and not. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, I would try to be out there with you, as I am in Berlin today. Um, no, really? I, <laughs> yes. that, that's I mean, amazing. I, get in a taxi. Yes, get in a taxi quickly. Say something. No, no, and but, jump in. But, but that's uh, perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, jump in a taxi. Yes, so uh, I'm a composer, and I've been here doing the DAAD uh, Fellowship in uh, Composition. Um, and I guess I would just say in answer to the first question, uh, can you repeat the question once so more? So where, 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 where you spent the lockdown and how this uh, was relevant for your artistic practice? Ah, so I spent the lockdown here trying to finish my fellowship um, and incredibly grateful to Germany and to the DAAD for allowing me to do so as my home country just seemed like a nightmare uh, as we've all seen. Um, and this time period has given me, it's been frightening, but it's also given me time to reconsider how I make work, why I make work, who am I making work for, and what really is my purpose as a creative person in the world. Yeah, that's really impressive. It would be lovely to have you even more with us, if that's at all possible, but Maybe I'll pass after the, the mic to... Yeah. Oh, you've got your own, yes. Yeah, my own one. Uh, I spent um, the lockdown actually here, um, where we are now, and uh, in the garden, which I all invite you to have a look at, which is behind um, uh, the former altar. When you walk up the steps, take a left, the door is open, and then you can see the small sculpture garden. Um, um, I'm very thankful to my wife for designing and insisting on building it because um, I didn't see the purpose of it, uh, but she insisted and um, now in the, in the lockdown time it was really unbelievable to have that privilege of a garden um, for ourselves and the kids. And I must say um, I really did enjoy that time, even though it was kind of scary and frightening, especially at the beginning where we all didn't know uh, what to expect. Um, I had, I think, the most intense time with the family and um, kind of a daily routine, which I usually don't have and really enjoyed. And then um, I started a conversation series I called 10 AM series, which was always based on uh, a conversation with someone somewhere in the world at 10 a.m. at their local time, so 10 a.m. Mumbai, 10 a.m. LA, 10 a.m. New York, um, and 
uh, that came really quickly out of an urge to stay in touch and, and stay in, in dialogue. Um, and um, at the beginning, I thought that we are all in this uh, together and um, uh, that it's kind of a uniting thing. But then you've really quickly learned how privileged we are here in Germany and um, that social um, unequalness uh, came out uh, in a more extreme way uh, than it's visible anyway. Um, and um, yeah, I would say that's it for the moment. Um, hi, yeah, okay, working. Um, I spent the lockdown in Berlin, in uh, Charlottenburg, uh, with my four-year-old son. Um, actually in an incredibly intense situation of uh, closeness and also realizing, um, like experiencing the collapse of uh, public space and also the incredible, impossible demands of uh, work where like time and space collapse and my table was at the same time the kitchen table, my workspace, my, my like the place where I, Eight work, breathe, sleep, and um, I engage in uh, incredible refusal because um, I did not want to have Zoom talks. I did not want to have strangers in my living room, and I also um, did like wanted to kind of uh, not pretend that everything was fine, but really understand the precariousness and the vulnerability that was going on, and. Um, I think something that became very preoccupying for me was to see how what we understand as public space all of a sudden was taken over by intrinsically private enterprises. So I did not want to have my public activities conducted via uh, private platforms. And that really scared the pants out of me. Um, to think that all of a sudden uh, public space was Zoom and Facebook and Twitter. So, like the one thing that has been a um, uh, pressing question for me afterwards is how to, what do we do about, about public space now to, to form it again? Um, yeah, that's that. Absolutely. Thank you, Marcus. Well, um, Johan and Julietta, I think we all had a similar experience of, of appreciating having a garden and getting closer to family. I briefly stopped worrying about Brexit because um, coronavirus was even more of a worry. Um, I run a business of about 35 people. Most of them are in London, a few in, in New York. And so as it, I'm, I'm a journalist and Dezine is a, a platform that reports on what's going on in architecture and design. So. I found myself having to balance the twin pressures of, of reporting what was happening in the world in terms of coronavirus because it was the most popular topic we've ever written about. Our audience jumped 20% during the, the pandemic. Uh, we kicked off our coverage of coronavirus with an interview with Lee Edelcourt, the trend forecaster, who, talked, who first was the first to define the pandemic as a potential to reset the world. It had 800,000 page views, by far the most popular story we'd ever written about. So trying to coordinate this orchestra of 35 people all working from home around the world, at the same time witnessing the collapse of our business model, because Dezine is very much, uh, our business model is very much based on going to places like Milan, doing projects with brands, um, then paying us to launch their um, new products and things like that. <laughs> we have a, a jobs website as well, of course, recruitment collapsed. So we're trying to juggle these twin pressures of um, an exploding interest in what's going on in architecture and design with an imploding business model. To, to, to long and short, we, we tried to solve the problem by launching our own virtual festival, but like it was a private space, but which mm -hmm. became my social um, and mental health salvation, actually, to be able to talk every day with live interviews with amazing creative people all around the world. And that became my network during the pandemic. Wonderful. And now we move on to Julia. Is it on? It's on? Yeah. In theory. I have returned from the jungle where I've been dieting um, daydream-causing plant huayusa for a month, eating terrible kind of bananas, plantains, and oat. And so I just returned. I landed in Berlin on my way to Athens. There was this lockdown, and I just continued the jungle diet at home. Also, I was finished with um, uh, filming of the last episode 
um, of the film called Trans Indigenous Assembly about practices of grounding. And so I was extremely lucky because I have filmed a lot of practices of grounding in Australia, in Siberia, in Cambodia, and many, many different countries. But I never knew how I'm going to deal with this footage now. And the lockdown helped me to actually edit the film. And also we were preparing the Down to Earth exhibition and we found ourselves in the situation of preparation of this exhibition, which now is the first exhibition that happens after the lockdown under the conditions of social distancing. This was this creating of public space under these impossible conditions and cybernetic madness that we were working on during the lockdown. And so it was a very intense process of transformation because we were actually preparing an exhibition which is unplugged and uses no flights. So it all uh, intertwined. Amazing. Thank you. Kung Fu and Zoom? Exactly. It's also the adaptability we have to, we have to I think, inspire the non-adaptive uh, parts of our society with. And that's why we're here. Mm. Thank you. Julie. <laughs> um, as you said before, um, the beginning of the year I was um, a bit over a month in Senegal for my art projects and a residency. Now, even the residency was came came very accidentally, something uh, which was not planned. And on my way back um, from Senegal to Berlin. I was talking to my Senegalese um, painter friend who was in that moment in Casablanca and I missed him in Senegal so I was like, oh, it's too bad. I, I'm the first time in Senegal and I'm not seeing you and he, he had suggested me, yeah, why don't you fly over Casablanca and visit me for four or five days. Um, it's almost on your way, the routine. And I was like, yeah, I mean, um, they pay my flight, so why, why shouldn't I visit Casablanca? It's a very ex you know, exciting thing. And once I get, got there, the, my next flight got canceled immediately. On the next day, um, it was the lockdown. So, and it was really not, not really announced before. It was, they were acting very fast and aggressively somehow. And... Yeah, and the lockdown, they extended the state of emergency um, again and again, and the lockdown again and again. So at the end, from four days or five days, I stayed four months um, in Casablanca without not really seeing the city. Because in Morocco, um, you were not allowed to take a walk or to be in the nature even. Like, even uh, to buy food, you needed a, I don't know, passeo shine. Um, the paper, the permission, which I didn't have with my uh, colleague. So, um, so, and I had a very beautiful small house um, directly at the seaside, and I was looking mm -hmm. through my window to the beautiful Atlantic, like very wide Atlantic, but I was not allowed to walk on, this, uh, on the beach. And I found it very ironic to watch every day through my window frame out and to look at this landscape painting somehow and not to and not to have the possibility to really experience that right and yeah and um i started to like in the beginning okay i thought okay let's calm down use this moment to clean up your external hard drive to finish update your portfolio and everything so everything what i can do digital i did but then they extended the lockdown again and again. And I was like, OK, I have to do something. Like, I really needed to do something creative and to create something. And I used it as a chance to, um, to paint. And I studied painting at UDK in Berlin, but I never really painted. I was always very conceptual in my works. And even now, it, um, since a few years, I really want to paint. I want to try it, but like in the everyday root, atelier studio routine here, I have deadlines and I'm running like from one deadline to another one, and they're like conceptual work. So I didn't really, really had, and then at some point you're taking over uh, unconsciously a role, right? Like 
okay, I'm a, I'm a um, conceptual artist, you know? You know, like, yeah, and I work with site-specific installations. And, and I thought, okay, it's the perfect chance. Nobody is looking. I can burn them at the end, but I want to start to paint, you know? And nobody will judge me or ask me any questions. I just paint. And because I couldn't um, find some materials there, I just found some empty canvases of my colleague. But I didn't know what to what to use for, to 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 fill the canvases, and so I started to use coffee, uh, and I started mm. to to paint very very intensively with coffee. Yeah, uh, I brought some of the pieces here, and you can also see in backhand right now, and uh, with the Boris collection. Um, uh, I also chose the smaller canvases of my friend, so they, uh, in the size of a luggage. Yeah. Oh. So, so you are happy with uh, this part of the creative process? That yeah, it was very inspiring, and at the end, and I think um, it was mentally not always easy, but because um, if if somebody would have told me like okay you, you have to stay in Morocco for four months I would you, you I would have used the time totally differently or maybe like a residency and very like relaxed but for four months I had my luggage perfectly packed because I had to feel I was uh, on the list of the embassy in the rescue flight they never took me <laughs> but <laughs> But I had the feeling like, okay, maybe they're gonna call me tomorrow and tomorrow I can go, you know? <laughs> and so this kind of very in a limbo and uncertainty. It, but I think because of this, uh, it, I, yeah, it was, I used it as an inspiration somehow. Yeah. yeah, that's so good. Could I say something about space? Because when you were talking about Zoom being negative, um, what I said about how I just did my stuff and walked in parks sounds extremely boring, but in fact, I was having to supervise MA theses of candidates who couldn't use libraries. And what happened was very extraordinary, especially in terms of people <clears throat> whom I knew very well and I'd been to the Istanbul Biennale with and I'd supervised other aspects of their work, but the projects they invented were very special and were actually, because I was privileged enough to be teaching in the contemporary sphere, very, very interesting new types of contemporary art project. For example, one girl who, when she was 15, had been living in Kinshasa in Africa, actually wrote her thesis about Kinshasa street art, but in a way that one would never have anticipated, thanks to Zoom, was actually interviewing Kinshasa street artists in their dark houses, you know, at different times of day and night, um, to make this project. Whereas one would initially have said, well, you can't possibly go and interview these guys. And another girl who was American, who in fact caught COVID, and was the one I was most concerned about with no family around, isolated, very pale. I had once a week Zooms with my class. She did the most incredible project. Um, um, oh God, I, Raja, um, what's his name, Raja, the Icelandic artist, something, Nassan. Exactly. She worked on the project she'd seen in Detroit, um, and her thing was called If Venus Could Speak. And he'd done a project in three different um, venues, three different iterations, as people like to say, with uh, people volunteering to be women in gold gowns. It was called... Um, woman in E, playing melancholic chords on a guitar. They had to keep replacing each other. So his, his job as artist was conceiving the work and minding the work in the places. And just, I don't know if he had an assistant to interview the people who performed, but my student whose project was called If Venus Could Speak, thought of interviewing as a kind of sociological project, because we're very interested in the um, concept of Nikolai Sorin Tchaikov, ethnographic conceptualism, interviewing, of course, by, by, by Skype, 21 women, a third from Iceland, a third of all sorts of various different social mixes from Detroit, 
And the iteration in Washington had opened the day after Trump was elected. And so although the social mix of women wasn't quite the same as it was, which was very, very complex, with all of these women were also crying when they played that. You can see I get very involved in my students' projects. I, I live vicariously through them and through books and things. Um, it was a most extraordinary project with 21 interviews, like an anthropologist, but a stay-at-home anthropologist, of course, in the tradition of armchair traveling, but something quite unique that went far beyond the actual concept and the remit of the artist, which was all, all, all the receiver of you know, someone going to see the work in a museum. Of course, I'm very proud of these projects, so I just wanted to say I wasn't just being very boring, writing my own stuff and going for walks in parks, but actually involved in amazing intellectual adventures. But that's exactly what uh, yeah. Julia did for the preparation. So maybe exactly. you can say yeah. something about the snake um, and how the... Because you said something yesterday in the performance uh, that um, the snake uh, in the Martin Gropius Bau that was also created by seven, right? By seven? Twelve. Twelve, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> by twelve women is a snake that allows us to enter through these little windows in the snake their world without us uh, being in the need to go there or vice versa. So we, we, we can be together even though we are physically not together. And I think this is also connected with the crisis, right? Very much so, because uh, I think that why you have chosen the topic of the symbiotic planet for this conference, just to leap it to yesterday, because we are not only focused on crisis of the lockdown, but in general, the lockdown itself is the result of us penetrating the jungle too far. And this is part of the climate catastrophe. So the symbiotic planet has been not read about and talked about, and the symbiotic planet has to be now finally performed, enacted. Um, for example, the snake uh, enacts this symbiotic planet by gathering different indigenous activists who have taken their responsibility for their own life in their hands as their response to Gaia's rage. So they have decided to found the live-worthy world and you know, we don't need Bruno Latour, and I personally was inspired by Lino Margulis something like 20 years ago, so I'm not referring her directly, but I just wanted to say that we know, I mean, we refer to them now as a common language we now have developed within this discourse. So Bruno Latour asks in the name of the Western world, the indigenous people, how have you managed to exist and survive under such circumstances? since a long time. And the answer of the indigenous people is, welcome to the club. <laughs> so the snake is the club which gathers, it's a more elaborated answer to this question of Bruno Latour. And it is also, we, we have been living this crisis and we have invented some worlds. And I wonder what I'm doing in the context of a privileged heteronormal white uh, neoliberal uh, world here now. And, um, but I wonder, but I also know why on the other hand, because I think this is the time actually of the symbiotic planet to really break all borders. And I have the feeling that you have a deep motivation, Mikolai, to support the activities of the indigenous activists and to enact this oneness of the world and to unite those diversities that present. Well, I have to immediately say um, that, that that would be a wrong um, uh, representation of my motivation. My motivation, so since I visited many of these tribes, I have basically, I'm grateful for what we can learn from them. I don't have the feeling that I can support them. I really have truly the feeling that they can support us much more than we can support them. Yes, but look, this is called epistemological colonialism. We have to give something back to the jungle. And uh, it's a relation. And uh, we don't have to have guilt or bad consciousness in asking them this question. And this is what I'm doing here also, to hybridize these worlds and to uh, present the possibility to connect with um, this knowledge in a not a rapist way, but in a, uh, in a mutual, in a symbiotic way. So, um, for example, you have already done something for the jungle. You have invited Abuelo um, Antonio. Yeah. And when he disconnected, which is the disadvantage of our precarious uh, online communication, which was owned by private corporations, the last words he said, it was um, to look. 
to look. He said, to look, and then the connection broke down. Yeah. So I'm inviting you to look. I just pick up telepathically on what he said, on what he said to look, and he was talking about importance of trees in his culture. So I would like you to look at this tree and to learn from him directly and just enjoy a quiet moment. Johan is already as in a symbiosis with the tree that is all the time in his care. It's, it's also a very tree. similar mathematic uh, curvature of the hair with the tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you, but, but basically, this lockdown you used to connect to these different tribes, right? Because yes, they are now connected in the snake, and also the snake has served as a platform to um, enact the Autonomia Academia, the self-organized grassroots university I have founded in Athens six years ago, also as a response to the crisis. And I'm welcoming the professors of Autonomia Academia, Clara Stella Hünicke, she is an um, intersectionalist feminist filmmaker, and our dear guest from Athens, Poka Yo, artist, founder of the Athens Biennial, and also director and also director of many different cultural foundations in Athens. We have been building these worlds, and we share the possibilities of epistemologies that intertwine indigenous knowledge with the Western science. Here on this Im unplugged embroidery of the program of Autonomy Academia, and just invite you to the snake. And today and tomorrow there are last days, and tomorrow there is a performance. And this performance is actually sharing the knowledge about the a knowledge about the transformation we need before we even start talking about building new cities. We need the inner transformation. We have to we have to find um, overcome the disconnect of us from ourselves, and I would like to ask you to uh, hold this microphone. Here. This song is um, dedicated to uh, Maestra Olivia. It is her song and her soul is present in the sound. Please just simply look at the tree and honor the indigenous activists who have been assassinated on the front line in their fight for our environment in Siberia, in Australia, and in Amazonas. something that Julia's practice fascinated me in Julia's practice that she was able to listen uh, to completely different uh, cultures and not only because listening is sometimes not enough you have to um, be able to recreate it and to learn through through doing not only through hearing and this is something that um, that, in my opinion, was also a part of this crisis, that we suddenly, this is everybody from you, described exactly one situation in the same way, 
that we were taken away from our usual routine. And because of this, uh, there is suddenly a space opened through this crisis to, um, to experience something new and something slower and maybe something more intense. I wanted now to ask on our screen, Motana, um, because um, uh, what was your uh, moment of, um, what, what was it for you also opening up um, this kind of space and how you used it for yourself? Uh, in a sense, perhaps it was opening up a space, but for me, it was also incredibly terrorizing because of the decimation of black bodies that was continually going on in the United States, as I sat here in a bit of privilege to make. Um, and so trying to figure out, well, how, uh, what really makes sense and asking myself very deep questions about my own internalized isms where you know dealing um heteronormative uh isms that are internalized through art practice for a lot of us uh born with ovaries um who may or may not identify as women the thought of the binary and the problems of which that exists when thinking about a, a work and my own privilege within the space um I had to, and I'm still trying to codify a great deal of guilt around that privilege that I have as an arts maker, even under a course of restriction, because I come from a culture. I mean, I, I am African American, but I am um, African American by way of England, Scotland, Wales, France, Spain, you know, all of these Choctaw, Cherokee, Chickasaw running through my, my bloodline. But I come from a culture that is very, set the foundation for, at least in, in my home country, of what is possible in restriction and how even through oppression and even through um, uh, an, imprison, an imprisoning of these external values, you cannot imprison the spirit. And trying to figure out different ways in which to pull on that while also feeling a great deal of guilt around my own privilege as an arts maker. Uh, people can say many different things, but as an American artist, for me, the, the life of an artist is a very privileged life, even in its poverty, even in its, its problems, because as artists, we are able to um, leave the world of linear, linearity yeah. and move into different zones of thinking. And that's, you know, that's why collaboration is so important because, because we can leave that, there's room for innovation. So just trying to figure out what's best there for me. Um, but I don't have, I wish I had a, a more kind of codified answer for you. It's been a, a practice of moving in between fear and hope and fear and hope back into fear again and also into areas of, of great trauma. I promise you, tomorrow, maybe the next day, um, by the end of the weekend, I will hear about another death of an American citizen um, by police and state violence. So uh, first of all, I'm uh, extremely happy to hear this answer because it's, uh, it's honest, you know, you're not giving, you, you, because we are in the process and you are ac actually with your answer, you're showing a situation that is developing and where we cannot basically have any knowledge yet uh, uh, build it up. And, and I really, really appreciate exactly this answer. What, what, what in your opinion, because we talked about the COVID crisis, but we have, and uh, this is extremely important that you mention it, probably interconnected another crisis, uh, uh, um, a civil rights crisis that, that is now um, 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 maybe one of the biggest uh, crises um, together with COVID that the United States are going through. Where you see the potential of this crisis if, if, if you look into creation, if you look into um, the means that an artist has to deal with it. Um, and, and you mentioned also collaboration. Uh, that I'm personally missing, um, uh, looking at the cultural sector. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, what, what would be your take on that? Well, I would just say that it's, I mean, there's, there is a lot still yet to be revealed. But what I have seen, you know, being here in Berlin has been fascinating in 
during this crisis and being reminded that as the civil unrest goes on in my home country, I am constantly reminded of my um, responsibility as a global citizen. And, and I think this virus has really shown a lot of us, reminded a lot of us who may not have had to think like that. I think many of us have had to think about that in terms of dealing. If you're really digging into arts and culture, you are thinking about these things. Um, but I think it's really kind of set a new match of possibility, uh, a different type of way of thinking about vocality. Um, because as an American citizen, I have never in my life questioned the possibility of taking to the street to protest, right? That is, uh, that is a born and bred right for me that I take very seriously and I have uh, used all over the world when I can because the, the idea of embodiment and bodies and space is so important in terms of moving uh, a needle um, in the struggle that we're currently in. Uh, but I see people, I see other artists really making new sort of inner contracts with themselves about risk, um, about the importance of risk. The fact that I sit here and can speak to you, the fact that I uh, can travel the world before COVID with a horn in my hand or with my art in my hand is testament to so many people who came together to embody, um, to fight for the rights that I now have to speak so freely to you and to even say the things that I just said without being fearful for my life, um, which I cannot say for my predecessors. So there's just, there's a lot of possibility there. Uh, but the, what troubles me most is that being a, of African-American descent and what America has shown me time and time again is that as black people, as brown people, we don't get to rest. Rest is not in the bloodline for us um, uh, in ways that they may be for other people. And, and rest is not in the, in the pipeline for anyone living below any sort of socioeconomic struggle. So this idea of, of how we can move forward is incredibly precarious because not everyone is having these privileges. I think what you say is totally true, and it's uh, not only true for black and brown people, but basically it's true for everybody. And uh, it was quite interesting because when we had our talk in 2018 with Arthur Jaffa and Tokwasa Dyson and Francis Curie, and we were talking about uh, you know different strategies, Tokwasa also participated in our Wellbeing Culture Forum, um, then somehow strategies developed by oppressed people probably now in the wake of COVID-19 are strategies that everybody should learn from. And one strategy is to be conscious. It's actually something that you will read already in the Evangelium, uh, yeah, that consciousness, to be always aware that something that, that nothing is written in stone, that everything can be changed tomorrow, you know, to the worse or to the better. And this is exactly the situation that uh, we found ourselves in seeing a world that may collapse already tomorrow. And the question is, what needs to be done that it can be Julieta? This is, uh, I had you already in mind. What, what is your take on this? Um, it's, uh, it's funny because uh, I'm, I'm going to start from the, what you were like, uh, you mentioned about me saying that Zoom was negative. Um, it's not exactly that I think is negative. No, no, no. I mean, like, it of course um, offers a number of possibilities, but it brings to mind the issue of who gets to be digitally represented, right? Who gets access to certain tools and certain platforms, and that's obviously not evenly distributed. And um, what, uh, like the, one of the things that I have been thinking is actually like a resistance, a resistance to work and to be like, okay, let me take my uh, lockdown holiday and be like super hyper, like neoliberal subject and produce, 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 but let me think and let me, uh, borrowing from like Donna Haraway, uh, let me stay with the trouble and let me think because I believe that um, things are not going to be the same. It's not going to be like, let's just go back to the way that things were. Um, actually, things are changing. I think that we were prepared for, um, you know, we were already thinking about the apocalypse and kind of like uh, set to 
as glaciers melt, things are going to get completely fucked up and we are going to, uh, you know, like uh, go through trouble. But then what happened is that it, uh, instead of that, there was a virus and what we expected to happen within 50 years happened in three months. And so that, um, like obviously there is like a lot to think about and it's not just like let's uh, rejoin uh, the you know like let's get back to normal because normal has changed and um so what i have been thinking about is um how does the you know like how has this virus operated what does it what does it do um and in my opinion what it does is um it it has been moving across the fault lines that are already there uh, in the society. So it's, uh, I don't think that one can say that we are fighting an invisible enemy. There is no fight. The virus is not an enemy. Um, it's a pathogen, but that's something else. Um, what is happening is that there is an issue of invisibility there. And the virus renders some things visible and some things incredibly invisible. Some bodies are made very visible, like people in Italy and in Europe getting sick, and some bodies are uh, uh, rendered invisible, like uh, this goes across uh, racial and class lines. So something that for me then becomes important is to think, okay, um, I am an artist, I work with systems of representation, what it is that I want to represent? and what kind of uh, space I want to create, and how do I uh, produce not, I mean, like, I, you know, I don't want to think anymore about producing the future because I think it's much more important to produce the present, and what it is the present that I want to produce and for, in, for, for which communities. And I, like, I don't think that I want to go back to making um, like just like happy artworks to fill uh, gallery and museum walls. I think it's a moment to really um, think about producing change in a much more radical way. So that'd be the thing to say. That's very really interesting. Johan, um, can, 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 uh, can you say something to uh, this new form of art production? Because actually this is only possible if there's resources. So resources needs to be organized for artists to be creative and to produce and to leave the gallery walls. This is something that you did already uh, with many artists before COVID. And uh, after COVID, I think uh, the situation was much more difficult. How, uh, how you see your artists going into the direction that Julieta described and how you see the, the possibilities, the strategies to, to adapt the system, maybe also of the art market, to allow this kind of creativity to, to go out? Um, I think it's, um, of course, it's a question of resources, but not essentially. I think way more difficult and challenging for artists is to have... Um, uh, to find a certain exposure and and find ways to show their art and share it with others. Um, of course, social media offers um, uh, great new possibilities, but but that's still then in its own context and 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 so to speak of bubble or network. And uh, that was also something I came across in in lockdown that after visiting via Instagram live, uh, Alicia Quade in her studio and uh, all the other artists represented by the gallery. I started to um, uh, do open call sessions where just random artists um, joined and showed their work uh, to, to a wider audience. And sometimes um, it was amazing conversations and in my opinion, great, uh, great work. And sometimes uh, not that much, but it was very interesting to um, to open up this um, these these categories, you know, of like um, um, what the role of a gallery is and and um, where you stand within the, the market and all these like um, uh, that. This is kind of like um, blurred lines, which I think is is very good, and um, but. As great experience it was, it, it quickly it vaporized after. I mean, we, we did then, now there's a currently a group show in London, which is based on all these um, um, kind of really accidental or, or um, uh, coincidental Instagram meetings. 
but because of the calendar and my time, we just didn't continue, you know. So, so um, uh, and of course, my role is working for my represented artist as an agent, advisor, financier, um, promoter, and so on. Um, uh, but at least it was an interesting experience. But it's a bit sad that that I have the feeling that we very quickly come back into um, our usual uh, pattern. But the, the Mäuse Bunker project that also was born in this time, or at least it was promoted strongly in this time, and the Mäuse Bunker is. Um, uh, this, I don't know if everybody knows about the project. It's this giant uh, brutalist building that, that served um, in former time as an animal uh, laboratory for animal testing. So it's a very dark, basically, history. And uh, this uh, building belongs to the biggest hospital here in Germany, the Charité, that is also a university, a medical school. And it was supposed to be taken down this year. And then, um, and then you, together with Anne Brandl, who by presented a concept to the public where basically artists would be able to create there to have studios, ateliers and to make it a center of cohabitation uh, where art and culture merges with nature um, and animals. Maybe you can say something about this project? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not really connected to, to that. It's uh, something we have been an eye on for quite some time. Um, and it's a really a beautiful landmark uh, building um, Actually, unfortunately, not officially a landmark yet, um, but definitely uh, from its relevance. It's a brutalist building um, in uh, Steglitz, uh, near the water, near the, um, I don't know what channel it is. Uh, um, it's not the Spree, it's a small, um, uh, it's next to the tennis club uh, Blau-Weiss. And it's, um, it looks like a cut-off pyramid um, with a lot of blue tubes coming out, which is for, um, I'm sure, a lot of people of you saw the picture of the building. And the Charité wants to tear down. And we think that um, this building is, a, is also um, helps us to understand how the world uh, was um, in the 70s, you know? Because it's like, uh, it's a laboratory for experimental um, uh, animal research. And uh, they moved the building now to Buch. And it's it's empty, and there's no use for it anymore. And um, but it became a different um, uh, relevance. Thinking of the the market, the 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 the, the market in Wuhan, and then uh, thinking of what happened with Tönnies uh, here in in Germany, uh, which is a, a mess. I think they forty thousand pigs a day um, uh, um, meat fabrication. And, and was a super spreader and and uh, I know think locked down Nordrhein Westfalen again for for uh, for another month so uh, the relationship between us and animals of course in this crisis also um, comes out and that's why maybe the project is even more relevant today than it was um, last year um, and we try to uh, buy it from the city at um, at cost, or we, we, we propose to deduct the demolition cost from the property value and develop it. And um, there's an exhibition right now at the uh, at, uh, BDR gallery, which I only can recommend to look. And there's a screening tomorrow of a, of a um, Lothar Hempel movie on the Mäuse Bunker. Um, yeah, but I think maybe that's another. Yeah, so for but me, just a quick excuse. For, for me, this, this is very relevant because you need space. So what Montana said, what um, Julieta said, uh, also what Julia said, to really develop strategies, uh, to develop networks, to develop collaboration, we cannot meet in Zoom only. We need space to test out also community, to test out social interactions, to build social sculptures. Um, uh, I, I have one question, one question to Markus, because uh, Markus is providing a big platform that is international, that uh, is actually one of the most important platforms for design and architecture. And what I would be super curious about is how your audience, but also how the providers of content, the creatives, responded to the crisis situation, how, you know, racial, social, and also uh, healthcare injustice, because this is uh, a big connected topic. How was this addressed, and how how was this part of your 
of, of basically the, the content uh, that, that we are providing. Well, uh, yeah, you talk about healthcare injustice. Actually, uh, one of my neighbors is a doctor, and we would run, not together, but during the pandemic, we would often bump into each other in the street, and he would give me the latest infi inside information from the healthcare service about what was happening. And, and the thing he talked about often was um, digital poverty. He said that the people that are impacted most by coronavirus are the people who can't afford a laptop for their child to study, who can't afford to go online to check the latest information. And it became like a, yes, another way of dividing society. I mean, there is enough division as it is. I thought Julieta's point about coronavirus not being an enemy, but being an in, in, invisible was really interesting. But I think it, it has, in a way, created a war. It's like an invisible smoke screen. And, and as the, the fog of corona diminishes, as we start to understand it, the, all these battles will go on for how the city get, with, will the cars win, will the pedestrians win, and so on and so forth. Back to your question, there was, there was a clear graph of the way that our, our creative community responded to the pandemic. Uh, after the initial shock of not being able to go out and this, this, this horrific thing has arrived in our midst, the, the, the first response of, of creative people was to try and help. I mean, there was a massive, massive outpouring of people 3D printing f um, masks and coming up with um, laser cut face masks and then proposing ways of, of um, then it became a little bit more sophisticated and proposing ways that you could social distance on trams and so on and so forth. There was a kind of almost like a glut, like a, a monumental drop of, of solutions many of which were ridiculous, to be honest. And even a New York critic described it as um, uh, corona grafting, which was people like, she felt that they were cynically trying to exploit the pandemic to promote their own work. I think that was a bit harsh, to be honest. But from that immediate like PPE, the literal, literal, like how do we protect people through our creativity? Now the conversation has been become a bit, bit broader and how do we reconfigure our cities? How do we save cities? If, if everyone with, who can afford to is fleeing the city, what happens to the spaces that are left? There's a big debate going on in London now. The car lobby is fighting back through the right-wing press and complaining that they can't get across the city in their cars quickly enough and blaming street closures because councils have now decided to um, close streets so that residents can cycle safely and so on and so forth. But of course, Nobody's using the buses and the, and the underground anymore, so there are more cars on, on the roads. So there's a kind of there's a, there's a battle there between um, making the city safe for local communities against the big the bigger picture. Um, and my experience of lockdown was I, I rediscovered my neighbourhood. I found little pocket parks I hadn't been aware of. I supported local shops and things like that. So I think there's there's a consensus emerging amongst creatives that the city will become much more localised. And the globalized network that we've all got used to, maybe that is, Zoom is the, the role, the place where that will, that will take place. Could I say something about invisibility? And going back to Montana's comments, though, because uh, yesterday we were talking about Adidas with um, recycled plastic. But uh, when Nica, Nikolai, we were at the 24-7, opening in Somerset House. It began with this painting by Arkwright, a romantic landscape with a moon in it, but the first all-night factory where people not worked not three eight-hour shifts, but two 12-hour shifts. And going back to Adidas, I just looked up the factories where these shoes are made. There are 337 of them in China like 99 in India, 79 in Indonesia. And in terms of this idea of look, it's people like Gursky's photographs who show us that we're actually in a different kind of first world global citizens profiting from people who aren't citizens, who are in a dreadful, dreadful state of slave labor. And I mean, this silent minority who have no civil rights in other countries, I think is extremely, extremely concerning. Your practice is very much to do with time, but this 24 seven time uh, with where people are just human interfaces is extremely, it's really like the big, big civil rights issue of the first versus third world, or whatever you want to call it. No, it's not exactly any definition of a third world. I find it extremely 
um, dreadful, and we are all implicated with our computers or whatever um, in sustaining this. And the work that had the most effect on me in that 24-7 exhibition, which I quoted in another circumstance, and I published in an article being published in China, it was um, uh, actually Berlin-based Uber Morgan's work called Chinese Coin Red Blood, uh, which was about the Bitcoin factories in the Uyghur region, where these dreadful concentration camps are where the people who are actually, not the camp workers, but the Chinese citizens, are in this dreadful situation of feeding Bitcoin computers to generate aleatoric numbers to make Bitcoin for mega capitalists in a situation where they just eat and sleep and eat bowls of rice. So there is this enormous, greater contemporary actual slavery going on, which I think is one of the great invisibilities, even in the midst of the coronavirus and um, Black Rights Matter debate. And I, I just wanted to raise that because it's something we experience together and which Therm is implicated in, but it's very, very important, I, I mean, think. Th th this is so interesting because indeed uh, through the industrialization that became actually in between you know, like flash bridge towards the future where they won't be any more necessary and obviously to do such kind of work and to live in, in the conditions that come with this kind of work is the most probably dehumanizing way of existence. And this is something that we are all part of and I think uh, b because we are actually the consumers that are consuming this product. So the consciousness again, and this was exactly the point of Julieta, uh, that we are in, and also I think of Montana, uh, Montana that, uh, that we need the consciousness and uh, the collaboration to overcome this kind of structures. And this is something that, that um, yeah, that in Julia's performance was so beautiful, visible. That was something that, um, that is actually reconnecting us to our body because if we, uh, and it, it was in Miami, the, the title of our talk was Back to the Body, and then Artur Jaffa opened it uh, with the, 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 the sentence, I'm obsessed with the black body, this was his sentence, uh, but it was about the body itself, you know, because the moment when we, and it's actually, when you go back to Thomas Aquinas, you don't have this division between the body and the spirit. This starts actually with the enlightenment, where we become a kind of computers that are living without ourselves, without our natural animalistic parts. And this probably connects also to the disconnection of nature, because if we disconnect from ourselves, we are also disconnected from our nature and the nature around us, what brings us back to the Mäuse bunker and brings us to a beautiful project uh, that uh, Givi uh, did. And I would very much want you to say something about it when, when you worked with the circus together and then all was left were the traces of the animals. And this is something that, uh, in my opinion, I don't know if this was meant in any ways in this direction, but in my opinion, this project was showing what happens you know, when there's only traces left and not anymore the animals that were there before. So if you may. Yeah, um, hello? Is it working? Yeah. Um, yeah, you're talking about Blinder Wi-Fi. It's called uh, Blind Applause in English. And uh, it was a big arena, 10 meters wide, a huge uh, circus stage. And I invited a whole circus team, a very famous one from East Berlin, in East Germany. Um, circus Busch, I invited them to perform the whole circus show on my stage, but before the opening was. And on the opening itself, they just left for me a sand drawing. I call it sand drawing. They left in the round arena, which was filled in white, with white sand. And they left their drawing and traces uh, behind. And when, for the visitors, it was a room with an empty stage situation. And you had... Uh, you didn't know, like, if you missed, it was also very playing with the expectations of, like, of our society. Like, we want to be, uh, this, uh, we want sensations, everything has to be fast and boom and loud and, you know, big and sparkling. And, like, I was playing with this kind of, um, it was a little critique on that, but also, in, and I'm also taking me uh, as a part, uh, this like a fear of missing out, you know, and you came to the show and you missed, you just missed that show and 
about the time and the absence and present, but the show itself, uh, the circus itself, there were presents within their traces and all the story was uh, written and left on the, on the ground. But this was the work, but um, I found it very interesting how you talk about the consciousness because um, due to lockdown time, I realized that like all the panicking and the fear well, it's very uh, mentally, right? Like uh, it's very mental, because like w when I had the lockdown in Casablanca, somehow I found I think um, the the friend Aliu uh, Diak was a great help because he's very like a Buddha Zen kind of person who who always told me like yeah okay you, now you can't go back um, even if if you have three shows um, coming up in Germany and you can't work for the shows, um, just take it. This is maybe what nature has to give you now, this, you know? And, and, and then I realized how me as a Korean, but Korea is even more westernized than Germany, I would say, in their mentality. We are very trained um, and educated with like cross the limit. And if you really, really want to do something, you will get it, you know? like and to always uh, this very much challenging and uh, that and uh, we, are we are trained that like accepting something and tolerancing something is sometimes is um, people confuse it with uh, a, a passive attitude which is a thin line but totally different you know and um, and I learned to to deal with the situation uh, like to be flexible and to find another way, like water, no? Like water always finds its, its way. You can try to block it, but then it doesn't, it, it doesn't care. You, it will find another way. And like this kind of awareness, attitude, and to reflect something because the corona crisis and the pandemic, it's not coming from the sky, like out of sudden. I mean, like every action we do, every, uh, bottle with drink or whatever, like everything we do, we leave a trace um, in, in the plant, visible or invisible. And this will cause a result and consequences. And um, yeah, and, and there's also a way to deal with it. And you know, like, yeah. I think. Yeah, thank you very much, totally. I, uh, I, will, I, I was thinking a lot about your work because the traces that are left uh, from these animals on the sand reminded me very much in the cities under Corona, you know, where all the social interaction, all the nice gatherings, everything was suddenly removed and then everything what is left is a very hostile and um, and uh, unnecessary environment. You, know? you, you just feel that there was something beforehand, but now it's completely gone and uh, probably uh, you know, the, the, the big task will be to build something where we can be also without, you know, the fear of missing out that you meant. I have a good friend that, you know, this, that before had to go to every single event and he was always... And now under lockdown, he became completely relaxed because he couldn't miss out anything because nothing was happening uh, anywhere else. So it was exactly this mental issue. So he was basically happy to be in this place and it was quite, quite interesting. I, I, yeah, it's a setup. Yeah, yeah. Total. It's a mind setup, but we can learn actually how we can reflect ourselves when the situations are changing. And maybe this is another thought that, um, you know, we are extremely privileged because no one of us uh, lived through the war. I was under lockdown in, in Warsaw and my grandmother, she said that, you know, I'm now, now is this virus, but I went already through the time of communism. That was, you know, our oppressive dictatorship where you could be taken into jail, what also happened in our family. And then before I lived through the Second World War, yeah, so she went through all this existential crisis and she was very aware that, uh, that, that everything can be different immediately. And, and I think that was... Uh, quite interesting because she she opened the eyes for me personally that actually this is something that that we should be ready to uh, to deal with and it can come any hour. I, I would like Sarah if if you if if it's okay I would like to maybe open up uh, for some if there are Absolutely. some questions from the internet um, or from the physical audience here. Shazang, I don't know if if we have the internet questions also prepared this time or. Or, or, um, 
or maybe there is something on the podium that somebody wants to add. Um, are there questions? So can I just so quickly say one thing? I, yes, uh, absolutely. I, I forgot to add to my answer to your last question, which is that another thing that architects and designers are increasingly aware of is that the collapse, the separation between humanity and nature, the separation between city and countryside, there's a lot of moves to break that down now, to reintegrate cities with the biosphere. Um, the, the guy hypothesis proposes that everything is interlinked, but we've cut so many of those connections. We've, we've caused like, traffic ca cascades, but with people, uh, things like the, the virus plugging the gap that we've built, how do we build a new web where biodiversity is in the city. You don't have to leave the city to find the biodiversity. Yeah, so this was our talk yesterday about James Lovelock, Lynn Margulis, the Gaia hypothesis, and I think that, that that's another extremely important point, that we see that our design is not considering the invisible. We are just too stupid, you know? So we need to consider the invisible, and then we see a life that is connecting us through bacteria, through viruses. With each other I'm always and very keen on the, the axis of time as well as the synchronic axis. And you wouldn't have this architecture had you not had the Second World War. And I just wanted to say in terms of my thanks to Thurman for the invitation, I've never seen Berlin so beautiful and kind of breathing so beautifully in this autumn. And yet, every, and yet I, I came to the uh, exhibition straight after looking at the A.B. Warburg exhibition and so every single cornice every trace of architecture every different architectural style here uh, let alone all the architecture which has been obliterated and bombed and been ruined and then reconstructed tells um, a story to do with the past as well as the present so to me um, what you said about your grandmother I mean it reflects my own academic interest the that period of extreme pressure um, it, it is, is part of the way in which Berlin is actually breathing at the moment with not only the relationship with nature, like even in this courtyard, but the, the styles and the stories of the styles, which Warburg himself was trying to put together. So I think the kind of relationship between that long axis, going back to Gaia as the goddess, because you're so interested in Greece and mythology, of course, and this was a huge, not only brilliant narrative invention, but mnemonic system for people who didn't have uh, the internet to help them remember things. And it's part of this extraordinary invisible heritage that we have. So I think this relationship between the visible and the invisible is one of the like motifs of our session. But I do, of course, want to open it up, as you suggested, Mikolai. So, um, but it's also and you're okay in charge of the virtual questions, because I can't do anything like that. I wanted to uh, quickly add, um, for because I think it's an interesting detail. Uh, if you look inside the church on the ground floor, you see all these brick walls. And these bricks um, are, in fact, um, the, res the, the remains of the bomb buildings in the neighborhood. So um, uh, Meringplatz was like the, the moment when the, when the bombers knew they had to unload all their bombs because they had to return. Um, and that's why this uh, so-called uh, Zeitungsviertel newspaper area was completely bomb flat. And Werner Düttmann, who, by the way, was also the contact architect of Haus der Kultur in der Welt, uh, where the Warburg show is, he um, collected all these stones and resurrected the church with was like the, the remains of the uh, of the aftermath of the war, and then also this idea of um, nature and uh, urbanism um, combined is very this utopian architecture concept is very um, well illustrated in that neighborhood here because you see there's a lot of now actually also they really did it very nicely. Um, uh, you have a, it's like a park, and then the, all the buildings around us are just like thrown in like dice. So, so that was the experiment of um, uh, like living in the in the in somehow a green environment, but still being urbanly connected because we are at the absolute city center here. So the geographical middle point of Berlin is uh, on the other side of the street, and um, and it's I think it's very interesting now to see if that. Um, if that concept now under under new under the new renovation will work out or not, um, uh, yeah. 
Um, thank you very much, Johan. So um, if there's no questions at the moment, I would ask everybody, we, we always do this kind of exercise to ask for one sentence, if you know one, if, you, if it comes into your mind, what would be the ideal sentence for a manifesto of the city of the future? And uh, if I could start with you, GV, if you... I it's will, mean. I will quote a user quote of Bernd Scherer, the director of HKW. Um, he wrote a wonderful text. I can only, I can just recommend. You can find it online, like in, um, connected to uh, the Anthropocene world and the Corona. And he wrote, um, "Navigate instead of control, instead of to to try to control." And I think this is the key point. Somehow That's we can beautiful. learn from it. Thank you, Julia. My sentence would be: Sing instead of talk not be so dominated by neocortex and um, come to Athens to join our new practice of art, which is not as environmentally destructive as the art market, and the Academia Platonos, which is the base, the foundation of our European culture, a public garden where we practice the Autonomy Academia. And I really have to run to Gropius Bau, so I will sing you an excerpt of an ancient Greek hymn Sarah has kindly mentioned, the, the um, epoch it comes from. That's extremely beautiful. Thank you so much, Julia. This was really, this was old Greek chants from the Oracle of Delphi. And now, Marcus. I was thinking back to the very beginning when the wasp was buzzing around us, and this is kind of irrational fear that humans have to be terrified of this tiny little thing that might cause us a minor inconvenience, but it will get better after an hour or so. Um, I think that the, the, the future has to involve us allowing nature to be wild. We have to get away from this idea of the garden, which is a controlled version of nature. Nature can regenerate itself if we let it get on with it. Thank you so much. Julieta? Uh, I mean, like, just like thinking about the idea of uh, finding um, equilibriums and things like that. The, it, it makes me think that it, like, it's not possible to find this, uh, an equilibrium that, is, um, that will stay. It, it, there is uh, a constant, like, to find equilibrium, it involves a constant recalibration. So the sentence that I would come up with is a sentence I have used many times before that is, um, something that says uh, the temporary solutions of the past only prove that it is possible to find temporary solutions. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Mantana, what would be your sentence for a manifesto of the city of the future? I'm a manifesto for the city of the future. Most of my work is focused around history of the past because history is so cyclical as we are experiencing now. And I guess I would just tongue in cheek as a very bad joke, but possibly as a future, uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for everyone instead of just for some. 
that's also extremely true. Thank you very much. Johan. Um, under the pavement is a beach. Oh. Thank you very much. We we'll take Pavilla it. Plage. Um, <laughs> so I couldn't um, think of a phrase, and yet, in terms of what I've just said, I thought of the phrase inscribed around the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral, which is um, not in French, but in Latin, si monumentum recreus circumspice, which means if you're looking for a monument, look around you. I think that everything like seeing parables in stones or leaves, I think buildings in the cities which exist are full of their own stories, which we must respect as much as their trees and their parks. And I also think that, as we know, in certain countries, there are hundreds of cities being built every day. I think that, as someone said yesterday, we need to curate, to care for our cities which exist and not think about um, building new cities, but rebuilding our cities from inside as well as outside. That was Mark Spiegler that said this, but um, yeah, it's a perfect reconnection to the forum yesterday. Thank you very much to all the panelists. It was really a pleasure to discuss with you. Thank you also for the audience. Big applause for the panelists. And in half an hour, we have another talk about the critical culture, I think. Thank you very much.